welcome once again to Cinemaholics, where we discuss the biggest and the best films coming to theaters and streaming online. One of those films is called X. Another one of those films is called Deepwater. And from the San Francisco Bay Area, I'm John Agroni. I'm the film editor for theyoungfolks.com from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He is a news and entertainment writer at Collider. It's Will Ashen. Hey, Will. Hey. We're talking about X, a sure. slasher movie. You know what somebody told me about this movie that I was very confused about? Okay. This was not just like a person in like civilian clothes. It was not just like a, oh yeah, you know, this, this was like a seasoned film critic person, somebody with like years of experience yeah. right. reviewing films. And they said to me, you know what, John, I have to be honest with you. This is a San Francisco critic. Mm-hmm. I think X is one of the greatest slasher movies of all time. Wow. And I was like, okay, give me a hit, whatever you just took, Hmm. because that is a very bold statement. Um, Have you heard any hyperbolic praise for X so far? Yeah, I mean, I was going to wait until our actual review to talk about that a little bit more. But yeah, I've been seeing a lot of people really being like, this is not just a good horror film. This is like a premiere slasher film. This ain't your grandma's X. I mean, it kind of is. If you look at it. (laughs) I'm wondering, though, if it's just like with A24, I think people expect something, you know, something a little bit more uh, uh, high know, caliber, maybe elevated. A little bit, Are we going to talk about elevated horror today? A little bit. But I think like I think people expect something a little bit more highbrow with A24. Prestigious. Like it has heavy, like capital T themes and it's about stuff. And now they made, you know, they, they took their style and made something not like throw away but a little bit more you know fun loving and goofier uh i think people are kind of like well this isn't just a fun time like this is yeah yeah calm down quit laughing right right. get serious and i have like mixed feelings about that but i'll wait until we actually review the film yeah yeah i mean we're gonna we're gonna review it pretty shortly just a quick rundown of the show i mean we're also going to talk about deep water which you know return of director adrian lynn it's been a long, long time since one of his films. So we're going to be talking about an erotic psychological thriller starring Ben Affleck and Ana de Armas. I'm actually excited about that conversation, but maybe not in the way that you're hoping yeah. for, Will. I don't know. I mean, I like I told you before we recorded, I think nothing to say about either film. I just think the conversation about Deep Water is more enticing at this moment than the conversation. Which is so X. funny. It, you're making it sound like X is going to be like the Eat Your Vegetables movie. And it's no, like it's this- not. That's the thing. Is that like, <laughs> yeah, it is, you know, like I said, it's like a fun slasher movie. But I feel like Deep Water is going to be a, a conversation. Like, like Deep Water, we're going to be getting into like Ben Affleck's yeah. head or something. And I'm, I'm a little nervous uh, about that, actually. X is the shallow water. Deep is the <laughs> Deep water is the deep water. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, sure. Also, uh, w- hopefully, we'll have a little bit of time to talk about South by Southwest um, because the festival just wrapped up. Will you cover the festival for the young folks? Uh, you've been working on some reviews for that, I think. And I hope so. you saw what, like thirty films for the fest? Uh, yeah, I would say at the moment twenty nine and a half films. All I, right. Um, I mean, one of them is X. X played at South yeah, by. I count that one in there. Just okay, yeah. I, I didn't see it as part of the festival, but I saw it the week of the festival. I was like, you know what? Mm-hmm. I'll count it. Why not? Sure. Um, sure. If they're not going to let me <laughs> count, that was one of the ones. Like, I, so I had the digital pass. They they did a hybrid festival this year. Um, you could go in person uh, if you had the the means to do so. Well, I'm glad we didn't, uh, Will, because I know a bunch of people who got COVID who went. Really? Yeah, wow. a bunch of people got it. Uh, at least were exposed. Some people are okay yeah. because they have they were like boosted and everything. Right. So they're like, oh yeah, I think I think I have it, but like I'm just laying low for a bit because it yeah. hasn't caught up to them yet. But yeah, I mean, people, I don't know. That's that's this kind of scary thing right now. Is that I feel like I don't know if it's just because the news is shifting to other matters or you know restrictions are loosening up. People think we're out of the COVID phase and we're not. And you know, I think a lot of it is people are just sort of like, I don't care if I get it. Like, I just think the vaccine yeah. will protect me or they're just like, even if they don't have the vaccine, they're just like, I, if I get it, I get it. Omicron's not a big deal with them. And so there's like, now that the restrictions are up, people are like, well, I don't know. To, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just, I'm just saying, be careful out there, folks. That's all I'm saying. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we, we did go to Southwest in person, South by Southwest. Um, yeah. Maybe next year. I I, ho- I would love to go in person. I think that'd be really fun. Yeah. Catch I have family. Flicks in austin texas i would love to visit them and to visit the festival austin's been 
one of my like I've been wanting to go to Austin, Texas for a long, long time. I almost went for my cousin's wedding. Unfortunately, it got canceled due to COVID. So I got very close to going to Austin, Texas, but uh, it hasn't happened yet. I hope it does happen. Maybe it'll happen with South by Southwest next year. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe that'll be the case. I'm going to be going to Austin for the first time, uh, cause I've been all over Texas, but for some reason I've missed Austin. I don't know why, but, um, I'm going to be going to Austin for the first time this year, but it will be like in December. So I could be going twice within like a couple of months. Who knows? Who knows? But let's talk about this X movie. X marks the spot, the spot being our first review of the week. And this is the big th- movie coming to theaters. Now, we had a bit of a lull of a week in terms of theatrical releases because, well, we had the Batman two weeks ago, and then Turning Red was the big streaming release, and wow, Turning Red uh, ended up making quite a splash uh, online in terms of discourse and conversation. Uh, it's been a while since Pixar movie kind of broke through the noise in that way, I want to say. Like, I feel like with like Luca and Soul and Onward, like they were kind of like low low key releases like people watched them people talked about them but they didn't like garner a reaction the way turning red sort of has is that fair i mean i know luca had a little bit of that but like it was it was a bit more of like people were thinking about that movie and people were sort of like is it a gay allegory and it, i don't know with turning red it seems a little bit more of like uh, lots of people saw it and have an opinion on it but sure i, I think I, I agree in the sense that I think it's more of a conversation starter than their past few films, also counting Onward and I think even Toy Story 4. Uh, but I don't know. I feel like a lot of people did talk about Soul. Like I feel like there's a lot of discourse, both good and bad, with that movie. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, I was just telling you, I just rewatched Soul. Uh, this is like my, my third or fourth viewing of the movie ever. Okay. Yeah. And super holds up. Like, I was so happy. I was so pleased at how well that movie holds up. I know that it has like two elements to it that people are like, eh, you know, they don't love the body switching stuff and they don't like the um, things involving, um, I guess, I guess there's the body switching stuff, but there's two elements that like the sort of like zaniness of the second act and the idea of like the, well, the white woman in a black man's body, yeah. all that stuff. I've heard some people say that the, the, the body, well, not just the body uh, stuff, but like the metaphor of it isn't quite as clean as like inside out or up or some of other P doctor Pixar movies. Like I feel like people had took more issue with the, the construction of it uh, in a way that I can kind of understand in some respects, but not really. I still really like that movie, so I'm not quite as uh, as hard on it as some other people are. Yeah, I, I think it's going to age a lot better than people suspect uh, because, I mean, yeah, no, it hasn't been that long since it came out. It's been only like, what, like 15 months or something like that. It's not been a long time. It feels like a while, though, because of pandemic years. I don't know. But OK, this movie X, uh, like I said before, uh, this is like the big theatrical return, though, because... Yeah, we lots of streaming releases. I know there was another big streaming release this week um, called Windfall that hit Netflix, uh, which we didn't see. But that's like the Jesse Plemons, um, yeah. Jason Segel movie. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, yeah I didn't Collins. watch that one. Yeah, I heard it's not great. Uh, yeah, it's Charlie McDowell. I think did that right. The guy did the Discovery and the one I love. Right. Yeah, yeah. and it, it kind of has that look too. And I, I might check it out because I like both of those movies uh, quite I did, a bit. Well, so. wait, I thought you didn't like the Discovery. I remember being kinder well, on the Discovery than you were. I was a little. I came around on it a little bit. Like I, I thought about it more over time, and I remember like in my like yearly movie rankings, I actually moved it up a bit. I think okay. I just had a harsher initial reaction to it. Okay. Um, there's another movie that came out this week called Amma, which uh, was Sander O oh, that. Um, yeah, apparently did, didn't do super well. There's a new anime movie called Jujutsu Kaisen Zero. Uh, yeah, that, which, uh, that actually I think was like the second highest grossing film of the weekend or something like that. Well, I'm a big fan of the anime Jujutsu Kaisen. Um, on, it's on Crunchyroll if listeners are interested. And I want to see it. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to when I'll be able to check that one out because it looks quite fun. It's a really good anime if people haven't seen it before. And then there was something, a new Dylan O'Brien movie getting good reviews called The Outfit. Unfortunately, I missed my chance to see The Outfit. I had a screening link, but I got too busy and I, I missed hmm. the window on it a few weeks yeah. back. But I, I heard that one's good. That's, um, isn't the guy that the screenwriter for The Imitation Game direct that, I think? And Mark Rylance is in it too, right? Right. So this is yeah. uh, Graham Moore. Um, and a, a kind of a, a youngish guy, you know, like I think he's like not our age, but like only slightly older, I want to say. Um, but yeah, he was a screenwriter and executive producer of the imitation game from 2014. And yeah, I heard, I heard this movie's a good, good bit of fun. I just wish it wasn't, I wish it was streaming <laughs> because I do want to see it. I don't, I don't feel like going to the theater, yeah. but, uh, it's in limited uh, release. 
Yeah, because I, I remember seeing the trailer for that one before something I saw a, f- a few months back. And I was like, I oh, haven't seen the trailer. Yeah, I don't, I don't know much about it. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, yeah, it looks pretty fun. I might check that out whenever it comes out. And I didn't even realize that came out this past weekend. Uh, yeah, it got a really yeah. quiet release. Yeah. Lots of, there were lots of quiet releases because Alice and Master both kind of dropped those. Those are two Sundance yeah. movies from this past January. Mm-hmm. And I know we, we already had a little bit of a conversation around those movies. I don't sure. really like either of them. Um, I'm but. warmer on one than the other. I think we'll talk about those more in a little bit. Uh, I don't right? know. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe we'll glide through those like as we end the show or something. Sure. Um, that might be interesting. Uh, I mean, I'll just say right now. I I think that if you have to pick one, uh, I actually don't know. I was gonna say Master, but I, I, you could make a case for either. I think both are like deeply troubled movies, but maybe that's just me. Sure. But anyway, we're gonna talk about X. So X is, as we already kind of talked about at the top of the show, slasher movie. Uh, this one's written, directed, produced, and edited by Ty West. Now I got to I got to admit I'm not the biggest I'm not super familiar with Ty West's films. I haven't seen his other horror films. I know he's been okay. making movies for quite a while. Um people know him for Innkeepers, House of the Devil, mm-hmm. um in the in a Valley of Violence and sure. uh there, there's another one. Oh yeah, the Cabin Fever sequel. I forget the subtitle of that. Yeah. One, but... Um isn't uh I forget actually yeah, but that was a weird one cuz like that just feels like Ty West summed up is that in 2009 he had uh, House of the Devil and Cabin Fever 2, like this direct DVD sequel and this like art house hit movie. And it's like this kind of mix of two sensibilities, like something that's like, you know, just like a schlocky sort of throwaway sequel and yeah. a like prestige horror art house film coming out the same year. It's like you can kind of tell like that that alone, I feel like kind of describes the trajectory of what came became X in a weird way. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like Ty West is a guy I like. I never really like loved any of his movies that I've seen. I haven't seen the innkeepers, but I think house of the devil is the one I'm most favorable towards though. I did enjoy in the Valley of violence, but that's the one where it's like, that's a Western, not really a horror movie. And it's like, it's a good solid Western, but I haven't really thought about it until like someone's like, Oh yeah, Ty West did in the Valley of violence. Like, Oh yeah, pretty good movie. Good. Uh, John Fulton performance, good Ethan Hawke performance, but not a movie I think about a lot. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen In the Valley of Violence. That was his last film, but it came out six it? years ago. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So it's been quite a while. Yeah, and he did uh, The Sacrament, too. He uh, did The Sacrament, yeah. yeah. Um, he's done some short film. I think he did, yeah, a few short films. I haven't seen those. Um, he's also done a bunch of TV. Uh, he did Scream and Wayward okay. Pines, a few other things. Like He clearly has like a nice little uh, comfort zone with sure. horror, but really with indie stuff in general. I know um, I... One of the first times I ever was aware of him was through some of his acting roles. Uh, so he was oh, yeah. in a few Joe Swanberg movies. I was going to yeah. ask. Yeah. I thought, is he tight with Joe Swanberg? Oh, yes. Very much yeah. so. Um, you know, uh, speaking of indie. Uh, yeah. But yeah, no, he, he was in uh, he, he was in uh, All the Light in the Sky. Um, terrific film. Uh, his last credited acting role was Drinking Buddies. So it's been almost a decade since he. Who is he in Drinking Buddies? He was Dave. Oh, Dave. The guy that, uh, you know, the kind of rebound guy for the Olivia Wilde character. Oh, OK. You got to remember, Drinky Buzz is like nine years ago. Like, it's not as fresh on my mind. <laughs> that's that's surprising to hear. I say sarcastically. Yeah, um, <laughs> I've seen that movie so many times, though. Oh, really? So, okay, yeah. I've only seen it the one time. I like that movie. That's probably my favorite Joe Swanberg film, but it's, it's, it's movie... one of his better ones. I think Win It yeah. All is probably my favorite, but Drinking Buddies okay. is like my like soft spot emotional favorite because i i do rewatch that movie pretty regularly so i haven't seen win at all that's the one with uh jake johnson right it is it is speaking of jake johnson i've been watching uh minx that has him in it that uh hbo max show speaking of uh you seen that of porn (laughs) yeah i know right he's it's just like porn everywhere these days yeah uh sex is back this weekend baby between all three of these things wow (laughs) <laughs> yeah so we, we brought it back to x finally uh so on that note x is a movie about a film crew in the 1970s they are making a dirty movie uh the film crew is composed of mia goth who's one of the actresses jenna ortega who's the boom mic operator uh martin henderson plays their like executive producer Brittany snow plays the lead actress and owen campbell plays the sort of like director ty west stand-in and the boyfriend of jenna ortega and Scott Mascuti, or Kit Cuddy, 
of course, Miscuddy. I don't know if that's how you say it. Kid Cuddy, Miscuddy. I don't know. But uh, uh, he's been in a few films before. I know people tend to be more familiar with his his rapping and his songwriting. But yeah. Uh, yeah. So th- that's like this film crew, right? And they are trying to make this movie outside of Houston, Texas. They are staying at this like farmhouse and this like elderly couple staying there. There's something really off about them. They don't know <laughs> that uh, this, this group of kind of like mixed age, like some of them are like in their, you know, 20s and then, you know, like 30s and 40s and all that. They're making a porno, basically. So in the age before home video, which this movie remarks upon, and I'm sure, you know, Ty West had fun with that because he's a very home video kind of filmmaker, uh, as we've mentioned. And things start to go a little bit haywire. And it's an interesting movie in the sense that, like, when you think of uh, slasher movies, you think of, like, the rules, right? Well, like, you think about how, like, well, if you're in a slasher movie, you got you don't have sex. Because, you know, if you have sex, like... There's just like the trope, you know, of in, especially movies, slasher films in the 70s of like, well, the characters who are promiscuous, who are sexually expressive, that was like those filmmakers way of um, condemning them implicitly through subtext and being like, well, they're the ones who are going to die. Right. And then the final girls, like, those characters were usually the, the virgins, the, the pure ones were the ones able to survive. And it's a trope that has been dissected and analyzed for many years and its implications and why it's a thing. And, I, you know, we've kind of gone away from that over the years. You, you know, we've seen it sort of change. Like the other thing, too, of how, you know, the, the black character usually is like the first person to die. The comic relief is usually, you know, all that stuff. But we've seen that like gradually change and evolve as more filmmakers have been, you know, making slasher films. And I think, uh, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the new Netflix one we talked about earlier this year, kind of an interesting culmination of all of that, I guess. Um, and maybe not, but with this movie, uh, you yeah, know, as we said at the top of the show, people are like, this is really great because those rules are sort of askew because it's, it's a porno film crew. They all have sex, you know, and there's just, <laughs> there isn't like quite that much, uh, there's a little bit more sort of a subversion people are saying about X, uh, in terms of what it's about. And maybe, you know, is it elevated horror? What is elevated horror? Maybe we'll talk about it, but, uh, yeah, we'll, I want to hear from you. What did you, what do you think of this movie X? Is it the greatest slasher film of all time? No, I, I don't think I'm quite that high on it, but I think yeah, certainly no. it is. It is funny that this movie is coming out. Um, I think only a few weeks after that uh, Netflix Texas Chainsaw Massacre reboot thing. Yeah, I just remember that it. was. Yeah, it's just it's just funny to me that that movie like that was like, hey, this is our attempt to cash in on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. And that movie was like so cynical about that film and all that. I I have like a I don't like that film that much, but I I almost kind of uh, begrudgingly respect uh, impressed, I guess, by how uh, cynical that movie is. (laughs) <laughs> that movie is but um and it's also interesting too because straight to netflix but this movie which is its own thing mm-hmm. original concept it's in theaters and doing okay i mean it's made 4.4 million dollars box office it's pretty low budget so that's not bad mm-hmm. but yeah i mean i think what a lot of people were really digging about this movie is that like you said it's subversive up making a big fine point about how subversive it is while also being by and large, a pretty charming film. Like, I think a lot of the the charm comes from the fact that the characters themselves, like, they're not, I don't want to say, like, outright always likable, but they feel a little bit more well-rounded than a slasher film usually makes these characters to be. They're not necessarily just, like, lambs to slaughter here, exactly. They they have pretty dimensional personalities. There's a lot of time spent crafting their individual quirks and identities, and also a lot of time spent building like the little traps that'll, uh, you know, kind of lead to their demise. But the characters themselves, you know, like they're not out here just making like smutty films. Like they, they recognize that they are making, you know, like a kind of trashy horror film or a trashy porno film. But at the same time, you know, clearly they're like, hey, we're going to make the best trashy porno movie we're going to try and make. And there's like kind of like a weird, like almost like... um uh, like, like a Super 8 kind of vibe where it's like, even though like what they're doing is kind of, you know, low rent and very hokey, they also are trying to make something, you know, widely appealing and something that they're going to be proud of at the end of the day. Yeah, something, you, you like yeah. them because they like themselves. 
They're not like yeah. self-hating or anything like yeah, it's it's kind of refreshing a little bit. Right. But there is sort of also like a poignancy to the fact that like we we kind of know from the beginning of the film that uh, most of the characters are not going to make this up, make it out uh, with their lives intact. You never know, Will. Let yeah. the listeners guess. I mean, who, maybe they'll all make. It. Yeah, who knows? But um, throughout the film, there is like a, a point where like the characters are kind of like, yeah, we know this isn't our, this isn't going to be our life's work, but it's a stepping stone for us. Like we're gonna try to do the best we can in order to you know prove ourselves later. And there's kind of a point. It's like best summer that. ever, you know, but the slasher version, right? Uh, that's one way to put it. Sure. I mean, <laughs> I compare make the this best movie, film we can. Uh, I compare this movie to Super 8, so I, I, I can't, you know, uh, complain about weird comparisons. But um, I do think, you know, there is a kind of poignancy to be made about the fact that even though these characters, you know, like they they realize what they're doing and they're not like ashamed of it. They're also kind of like, oh, like this is going to be a good stepping stone for us. We're going to make the best kind of trashy porn movie we can so we can go on and do better things in life. And the fact that most of their lives are going to be cut short adds a kind of poignancy to what happens to them. But at the same time, we should say the director character is a little bit more like snobby about it. He's a little bit more of like, this is cinema. You are you know. talking? Uh, wait, are you talking? Oh, you, you're talking about the guy from no exit, right? Not Martin Henderson. No, cause producer Martin Henderson guy. is the producer. Right. And then this guy is like the director and the DP, right? Right. Yeah. And he's he's like just sort of, of like, this is no, I'm trying to make a great, right. You know, piece of art. And they're just mm-hmm. like, all right, dude, sure. Yeah. But I mean, like everyone else is also like kind of getting into it though. It's not like they're like outright just being yeah, like, yeah. whatever, dude, they care like, about it. Right. Yeah. No, that's what I mean. And that's what I find very endearing about this film is that like, like the characters themselves, they recognize what they're doing and they're not like acting like it isn't what the, what it is, but they're also not trying to make it low rent and like, you know, they're not trying to make a bad film at the same time. And I think that adds a lot of the charm and charisma of the film, in addition to it being a pretty well-crafted fun slasher movie in its own right. My stance is that like all of the stuff leading up to the more straightforward horror slasher elements, like the whole moody, creepy buildup, the atmosphere, the little touches of like, this, how the film is shot when they're at the gas station, you know, the, them coming into the farmhouse, sort of exploring it. There's a scene with Mia Goth, you know, swimming in a lake, like all this tension and buildup. I was thinking to myself during all of that, it's like the first 45 minutes or so. I was like, I think I'm going to love this. Like, I think this is going to be one of my early favorites of the year. I think that I'm just going to like drink this whole movie in. And and then it turns, you know, it, it does what you expect it to do. And, you know, it, it fulfills its promise of, well, here comes the slasher part. Here comes the horror. And I was a little let down. I think I got my expectations a little bit too high based on the early parts. And I ended up just kind of not really getting into the slasher stuff nearly as much as the early buildup stuff i just thought this like like once you get into like the kills and if there are kills and you know just sort of how everything goes about and i i don't know i was just like well this is just like a regular slasher it's very standard it's very like cut and dry almost even though there's blood i don't know i just felt like it wasn't that uh, nearly as engaging and atmospheric and creepy and unsettling save for like two or three scenes like there, there, there is like one particular sequence involving a bed that i won't say anything else on that i'm just like oh my gosh like that was absolutely like i can't believe this almost everything else though i was a little bit like ah okay you know that's fine. And then the movie just sort of ends. And I was like, well, you know, that was, that was fine. You know, I had a good time with that, but yeah, I just, I wasn't blown away. Um, yeah. Overall. I feel like that's kind of a, an issue I've had though with Ty West in general. Cause I ultimately sort of agree that even though I, I found the movie generally pretty satisfying, I find myself more taken by the film when it's building up to the, the climactic moments as opposed to the actual stuff that happens in the climax. Because, like, you, you see House of the Devil, and that's mostly, like, that's 70-something minutes of a woman walking around in a house for the most part. It's been a while since I've seen it, but most of the movie is just her kind of walking around and building up the atmosphere and tension. But you got to get and those steps in. Well, was she wearing sure. a Fitbit? You don't know. That was a pre-Fitbit. Uh, <laughs> it was also a period piece, so that was pre-pre-Fitbit. Um, but, yeah. She was I mean, ahead I, of her time, Lashin. I haven't seen the innkeepers, like I said, but I know like that movie's a lot of kind of similar things where it's like a woman in like a creepy hotel and it's like a lot of build up there. And also I didn't mention it before, but the sacrament was another film that he did. It's kind of a lot of build up, like building into his cult 
You mentioned the sacrament. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean like kind of like that's also a lot of build up to like to this weird cult and even in the Valley of Violence kind of like building up this show. I feel like a lot of his movies are like about build up in a weird way. And I think he's good at building up stuff and less good about paying that stuff off. And I feel like this movie was a little bit better about satisfying the payoff. But at the same time, when I think about the film, like I feel like I was more endeared with it when it was actually building up to what I expect was going to happen as opposed to when we actually finally got to like the bloody, uh, you know, catharsis of it all or whatever the word would be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Looks like we're on the same page. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's interesting because I'm really glad that I didn't watch the trailer for this. I didn't really, I didn't know anything about yeah, it. No, I, knew yeah. That, yeah. I knew Mia Goth was in it. I knew Jenna mm-hmm. Ortega was in it. I didn't know any of the other actors. I, oh, I, I knew, didn't know. Uh, I knew Britney Snow was in it. That's the only. Other I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. I didn't know that it was in the seventies. I didn't know they were making a, a film or a porno film or anything. I I knew nothing except for like there are two actors in it and it's a scary movie. It's a slasher, and that was kind of fun because I was able to sort of like follow along and as like I think like that experience, like the first like fifteen minutes of getting into this world, were all the more engaging for me because of that. I was a little surprised, you know, in a kind of in, you know, a good way that uh, Jenna Ortega, she's not really the main character here at all. Like she's just kind of like a, an, ob, an observing sort of character. She kind of moves through the plot. She's a bit on the sideline. Um, it's kind of like a sort of almost a red herring that she's featured so prominently in the marketing, right? Because, you know, she's coming off a of scream yeah. um, from earlier this year and she, you know, she was also in the fallout and she, mm-hmm. you know, she's sort of making her name for herself right now as an actress and particularly in horror films. And this is another, you know, use, I'll use a word you used before in terms of the characters in the movie, but it's a stepping stone for her, I think, uh, just getting even more cachet as an actress. Sure. Uh, but Mia Goth is really the main actor here. And yeah. Mia Goth, who I think is getting a lot of praise for her performance, and I think rightfully so. I think she brings this movie together. I think if not for her, if if they had sort of if, if this char- if this movie was missing that character, if it was missing this the severity of those beats and what she brings to it, I don't think it would be nearly as good as it is. Mm-hmm. Especially because like the movie tries to like sort of haphazardly throw in this sort of like religious fundamental stuff into it um the sort of like consternation and moral panic involving these characters and like what they're doing and i don't think the themes come together super well i think that's a big reason why the slasher stuff isn't as good as it should be because i I just don't think the themes really connect they don't really come together you kind of have to like read into certain things and sort of just come to certain conclusions on your own but i think that I don't know. There's something about the Mia Goth character and and how that stuff sort of comes together that I do think is effective. And because I, it's her performance. I mean, I think like that particular lake scene with her is fantastic. It's super well done. So I think all my favorite movie moments from this movie are because of her. Yeah. I mean, I think it's fair to say that the, the movie, it rests on her shoulders. Like she's obviously, even though the movie is an ensemble piece, it's really her film ultimately. And, and I think, yeah, she has such a, distinct screen presence that's kind of hard to put my finger on i've always been like going back to like uh cure for wellness like i feel like going like she has she has like this very distinct look and it's very like kind of beguiling in a weird way and i feel like she really leans into that with movies like this and high life where she's like you know like she's a good actress in her own right but she also has a very distinct screen presence and i feel like she really hones into that maybe more so with this movie than anything she's done so far it makes me excited to see where she's going to go next yeah, I mean, she was she married to Shia LaBeouf at one point. Uh, I think they're I still think, together. Are they okay? And I, I think that um, yeah, everything I've seen her in, I know she was in Mayday, and um, I, I'm surprised you mentioned High Life and not Suspiria, but I'll mention Suspiria because I, yeah, I'm a much bigger of fan of High Life. Uh, oh, I think they're both very good, but yeah, I'm, I'm certainly more of a a fan of Suspiria. Sure, but, sure. But like you know, it's it's kind of funny because like the last you know movie that I saw her in um, in theaters was Emma. You know, which is such a different kind of movie for her. You know, um, the uh, you're, you look confused, Emma. Remember the uh, not with one M, but the one with um, what's her name? The it's the Jane oh, Austen. Oh, yeah, 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 with, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, but there's the one with the uh, didn't Pablo Lorraine also make a movie? Yeah, not that Emma? one. I know, okay. I know. You would think like which right. you know on trivia, like which which Mia Goth performance or which Emma <laughs> was Mia Goth in, and, and you're like, oh, well, clearly, <laughs> um. Uh, but no, no, no. Uh, this is one with Anya Taylor Joy, and yeah, you know, I thought she was quite interesting in that movie. And she, she yeah, didn't she also too. she was voiced a character in uh, the house, right? The, uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, the first segment, I want to say, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, terrific actor, 
you know just just yeah. just putting that out there and, and, and it's not even that i don't like the other actors in here i just think that she's like a cut above a bit now but that said i think uh britney snow and kid cuddy in this were my kind of my second two favorite performances here sure. like i just i think that they just brought so much warmth and humanity to this like group of characters like they're not friends you know like any of these people they're, like, they're all just sort of like they're they're like a you know they're three couples and they're just sort of like thrown together you know out of happenstance more than anything else and i just i like how like they're like they're bantering their chemistry or lack of it and just the way that like the britney snow character and the kid cuddy character just sort of bring this i don't know this like element to it that i think is really just inherently fascinating like the way that they interact with them and like you kind of yeah. mentioned before it's like the, their self-confidence they're sort of like yeah we're doing it like we're doing this because we love to do it that you know this like whole like self-love you know attitude about life it was kind of infectious and i like them a lot yeah i mean i don't uh profess to know too much about the porn industry but i kind of like that their dynamic is like we're not really like a full out couple, but we know each other in the biblical sense. So it's not like we can't just be like, yeah, it's like friends. Ben Affleck and Anna Darmus on the set of Deepwater. Well, I think they became a couple during that film, but I get what you I mean. That's what I'm like, saying. <laughs> they had like a fling during that movie, right? Right. Or reportedly. But I mean that like they're like co-workers, but it's like, well, we our line of work is that we get to know each other in a very intimate way. So we can't just be like casual work buddies, but we're not like an outright couple. But we like we like each other, but we're not like like each other like uh, all right romantically like there's kind of like a like an edge to their relationship they find very appealing and i think yeah i mean it's a good showcase for britney snow who like you know she's done the pitch perfect movie she was in john tucker must die but i feel like she hasn't really gotten too many like showcases on her films because like pitch perfect is more like the like uh anna kendrick film and you know like john yeah. tucker was like 15 years ago she's or not, whatever now she's very rarely like a like an elite actress yeah right like i think um was she the lead in like prom night maybe i, I don't even remember i think um, it, that was like god that was like 12 or more years ago yeah it's like it's been a while since she's been in the spotlight really yeah she's usually like she's yeah she's usually like the friend character you know she's kind of in the, yeah like a hairspray she's she's like not the main yeah it's it's interesting like she still is that in this but i think she has more of uh, an impression in this movie than she has in other things well, yeah i mean i feel like like with prom night and john tucker she's like kind of playing more of like an innocent character like the younger innocent sort of people around more promiscuous personalities mm-hmm. and then like she kind of plays against them pitch perfect but like i said like i feel like she gets overshadowed by anna kendrick and rebel wilson and a few other performances in those films so like this is a good like okay like here's like a Britney Snow showcase not her film but she can kind of prove herself and stand out in a way that she hasn't really been able to I feel like too many other times since then that's you know it's exciting to see yeah I, I agree um now we, we I guess we've talked about this movie enough I, I don't know I there's not much else to say uh, I know they're they're already working on like I think they already made a prequel to this movie like Ty yeah, West did, you, did that ahead of time hmm? did you say for the end credits. Um, I did not. Is there oh, something that's after the end credits? Yeah, there's a teaser for it. Oh yeah, I was out of there by before the credits finished. Oh wow, yeah, you should have seen it. Yeah, I'll send you the link. It's on YouTube, but yeah, there's okay. a teaser for Pearl. The, um, I, the I just heard, yeah, that they're they're they already made another one. So you know, it looks fun. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I think yeah. yeah, it's supposed to be a prequel about the uh, the elderly couple. But yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, good movie. Not amazing. I mean, that's not. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I I wouldn't um tell people like, oh my gosh, you have to see it. I mean, but if you're a fan of like slasher movies, yeah, totally check it out. It's an original ha- slasher in theaters. Like, what do you want? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's like smart stuff in it. Like, I really like how the movie is able to parallel like real life with the filmmaking process and how, like I said, like there's a poignancy to how like what's going on with their film is sort of mirroring life in a way that, you know, there's a bittersweet quality to it in a way that I think is really endearing and also ultimately kind of tragic in a way that I feel like other slasher movies don't allow themselves to be. But at the same time, I feel like people are kind of putting this movie on a pedestal that's maybe a little too high. Like, I think I went into this with maybe too high of expectations. Like I was hearing all the really terrific buzz and I was like, Oh, this is going to be like a midsummer type movie. Yeah, it's, I don't think it's quite that for me, but at the same time, like I would put this above the visit or something like that. Like another, I don't know. I, I'm kind of getting tired of this trope where it's like old people are weird and gross and creepy. I feel like it's kind of getting played out, and I was, I was getting I a little agree, tired yeah. of it. 
I was getting a little tired of it with this movie too, but I do think this movie is a little bit more skillful in how it leans into that trope. But I also kind of feel like, can we do something else? Like I, that's kind of getting played out at this point. But played overall, out. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's played out, know. and it's just it's not that interesting. It's just not that like I don't know. Th- that's what I meant by like the themes not really coming together super well. It's just like we've yeah. we've already seen this kind of movie plenty. I mean, often before. Yeah, it's also pretty outright ageist too. But um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's it's just like yeah, it it's just kind of feels a little played out at this point. I think. It's okay. A movie can be ageist, you know. It can you know to make a point. You've heard here from right, folks, but John says you can be ageist. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's if not like the director themselves, like the art itself being a just like intentionally so. But in terms right. of like using that, right. you know, as a way to like not to promote ageism, but to display right. what it, how it works and all of that, you can do sure. it. But, yeah. you know, I don't think that movie I don't think this movie is really doing that, though. Per se. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Um, play, but yeah, we'll, fun movie. Yeah. Let's play the Rotten Tomatoes game. We're going to do this. Let's do sure. it. Uh, the only last thing I was just going to say is uh, Jenny Ortega. I mean, I'm excited to see where she goes next. I think she, if she wants to go staying in horror, I think that's more than welcome. I think she has a pretty expansive career ahead of her. But if she sticks in the horror, I got to say, she has a great scream. Like, just like in general, like she's really <laughs> she's good a scream at screaming. Queen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's. I think there is a reason why they like put her all over the posters because that that is like a very iconic looking scream that she does. Uh, in that, um, like I saw the thumbnail, like a bunch, like of her just like yeah. screaming at, like she sees something and then in the movie, it's super effective. So mm-hmm. yeah, th- yeah, I agree. Yeah. hundred percent. All right. So Rotten Tomatoes game, we're going to, we're going to have Will Ashen here try to guess what the Rotten Tomatoes score is at the time of recording. Now we're recording this of course after the weekend. So, it, we, you know, lots of reviews have been counted 137 and yeah, critics, critics have said what they, they want to say. We just said what we want to say. Let's figure this out. This Rotten Tomato score. What's your bit? What's your best guess, Will Ashen? What do you think? I'm gonna say 86 percent. Will Ashen guesses 86 percent, and he is off by 10. Do you think it is 76 or 96? Uh, traditionally, horror films have been underrated as opposed to overrated. So I'm gonna say 76 percent. 96 percent is the correct wow. answer oh, can you right, believe right. it i i genuinely did not see that coming like when i first started this movie i was like oh yeah this is gonna be because i know it's a24 but it's like a 96 percent on ron tomatoes i'm telling you people are like going gaga for this x movie i mean good movie and I, I can't say i'm like on their level with it but it's like a solid like b level movie i think yeah i mean i saw b's and stuff going around but yeah i also saw like five out of five you know an A minus A, like all kinds of like high ratings on that effect. Um, but okay, uh, what about the audience score? We have two hundred and fifty plus verified ratings. What do you what do you think audiences have to say about X? Did X uh, give it to? Is X going to give it to? X going to give it to you? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to a little bit lower uh, and say eighty four percent. It's not eighty four percent, but you're a little bit closer oh. this time. Seventy eight percent, so a little bit lower than that. But yeah, I think I think audiences are the same as us, just kind of being like, all right, let's see what this X movie is all about. You kind of yeah. you set us up, brought us in, we're here, and then it's sure. like, oh, you know. Um, I I forgot to check for the cinema score. Let me look at that now because I imagine it's, it's not amazing. Uh, but actually, no, it doesn't look like it has one. Oh, really? That's surprising. Huh. I wonder is it if maybe it's a more limited release than I thought. I don't know. Uh, that's not true. I mean, at least locally, it's. It's playing way wider than any recent A24. That's what I thought. I'll, I'll double check because you never know. Sometimes um, the cinema score can be a little bit more uh, elusive. But yeah, I'm looking right now and I just don't see it. So I guess that is that's that. I don't know. I mean, maybe those folks in Vegas are just like X doesn't mark this. Did they forget the title of the dang movie? What do we? <laughs> What oh, am I so coming here to see? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They saw the X and they're like, oh, I guess it's canceled. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Letterboxd. I'm not here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We have 31,000 watches on Letterboxd. Uh, that's a pretty good number. Sure. Uh, what do you think the average rating is out of five? Uh, 3.8. Perfect. Spot on. Oh. You did it. 3.8 out of five. And that, that tracks because uh, especially like on my Letterboxd following like I'm seeing mostly three and a half and four stars, um, a handful of threes. So yeah, there you go. 
if I had, I would, I'd probably be more of a three or three or a half, maybe like in that zone, you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm like between a three and a 3.5, somewhere in between there. Yeah. It's a good movie. Maybe we'll agree less on this next movie. I hope so. Um, you just I have you want the to sparks say. to fly like between <laughs> Ah Armas and Ben Affleck in this new film. <laughs> I just I just appreciate that uh, we're comparing the chem- we're comparing the chemistry of the host of Cinemaholics to Ben Affleck and Ana de Armas, and oh, that man. is a that is a Pandora's box I do not want to open. Yeah, that's uh, I, I that wasn't meant to be uh, uh, something to dive too deep into. But well, what, yeah. oh, dive too deep, yeah, mm. oh, deep water. Boy. Yeah, there you go. Puns. Not one word. I know there was another movie called Deep Water Horizon. That's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about. The latest erotic thriller, psychological thriller, directed by Adrian Lin. We haven't seen Adrian Lin in quite a while as a director. And, uh, you know, quite well known, not inventing the erotic thriller in the 80s, but helping establish it, right? Movies like Fatal Attraction, you know, like I'd say like one of the first mainstream erotic thrillers was probably like Body Heat or something like that. People can discuss and debate. But no, Adrian Lin, you know, certainly... Uh, one of one of those directors between like Flashdance, nine and a half weeks. I mean, certainly somebody who uh, in Decent Proposal, the remake of Lolita. Pe- people rely on Adrian Lin's like filmography. Like the, I think when I think of one of his films, I think of um, you know like the saxophone, right? There, there's like a smoky hallway. The saxophone yeah. is playing, and that's when you know like okay, we're we're about to hit sexy times are about to sure. happen, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, like probably one of the most iconic images in film imagery is that, you know, that scene in Flashdance where she pulls the lever and she's on the seat and the water falls down and it's like steaming and all that. Yeah, hell, that's Jennifer parodied. Beals. Yeah, I mean, hell, that's parodied in uh, Shrek 2, a film I've been watching uh, multiple times this year. Shrek 2? Yeah, uh, yeah. I can't say I've ever heard of Shrek 2 right. before. Yeah. I don't, is that a movie? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a film. <laughs> now, his latest, his last film was called Unfaithful. I remember yeah, critics liked it. Ago. You know, yeah, yeah, it was it was a pretty well liked movie. Um, I think it got like some Oscar buzz. I don't, I don't know if it won sure. anything. I mean, I have to look into that. I feel like people were like, I don't know how they felt about the film itself, but I remember everyone was like, Diane Lane really giving a great performance in this, doing some solid stuff. Yeah, I Richard like Gere too. Thing. Richard Gere, yeah. Gear, sorry. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, I mean, it's been twenty do you, years. Do you jeer at the gear? <laughs> I do that a lot. I I, I when I see g's i like yeah. to say j instead of g i do it with like jif instead of gif and I, I like to say corgi instead of corgi i don't know why like i know the correct pronunciation sure. it's kind of like how people tell you millions of times a year like oh it's can well ashton it's can you yeah. can say con if you want and you're like you're, that sounds great to me I, I can't wait for cans <laughs> yeah <the cons. laughs> um yeah uh <laughs> it is jif though right not gif well, yeah, there's a whole debate about it. Like people are like, "Well, the creator says it's GIF, so we're right. going to call it GIF. GIF." But then other yeah. people are like, "It's GIF. I don't care if the creator said it's GIF. It's GIF. Why would it be sure. GIF?" I mean, if you said, you know, it, yeah. Uh, if you say, uh, or, or, well, the, the, I guess the mix then is, uh, what do you say? You say Euro, or you say Gyro, or Giro? I say Euro, okay. or Euro, Euro. I, it kind of depends on my mood, you know. Sure. You I don't, add, but I don't. I never say Giro or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. Or Giro. I don't think you're supposed to say that. It's euro anyway. or whatever. Um, anyway, deep water. There's a, there's a good joke about that in Soul that I forgot. <laughs> I forgot oh, really? Soul had a whole thing about euros in it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, deep water. Uh, it stars, as we mentioned, Ana de Armas and Ben Affleck as a couple, a married couple who hate each other. Like they just like, from the first frame, you're like, oh my gosh, why are they still married? They should have been divorced years ago. They have a young kid, and maybe that's why. Maybe you know they have this young kid played by grace jenkins who you know she's precocious you know she is like you know she uses alexa like the amazon echo to like bug her mom like pretty relatable stuff and that's that's your first hand of like oh they're, they're trying to make it work for this kid you know but then like as the movie keeps going it, it just keeps getting like more and more of like what what's going on with these two? Because, you know, Ben Affleck plays uh, a cuckold basically where his wife is just like flaunting affairs in front of him. Just like 
to his face, you know, just like taking on like, like flirting with other guys, clearly sleeping with them. And his friends are concerned. They're just like, um, don't you care? And I remember watching this and being like, this seems really like suspiciously old fashioned because like, I don't know, these days that kind of arrangement is certainly more normalized than it used to be. There are lots of people in open marriages and it, I don't know. It, I get it. Um, especially like this movie sort of implies that it's not a formal arrangement. It's, it's kind of unspoken what's going on here. Well, um, I don't know if you mentioned it, but the novel that this is I was based about to mention, on. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's a 1957 novel by Patricia Highsmith. And that, that when I, I didn't know that until after the movie. And I was like, that makes a lot more sense. Um, because, and I kind of wish it t- took place in the fifties because, it just felt so like, I don't know. It just felt like my dad or like, I don't know. My dad would not make an erotic thriller, but yeah, it just, it, it sounded like somebody from my dad's generation trying to like adapt a really old fashioned story to the modern day. And it just doesn't, I don't, it just doesn't work. Like, and, and I, I'm sorry. I know people are liking this movie. Some people really hate this. Um, and are just like, this is trash. Burn it to the ground. Other people are like, no, this is can't be fun. This, you know what? This is fun to watch. It's it's so bad. It's good. Some people are saying like, it's actually kind of good. It's, you know, some people are like, this is genuinely like a good movie. Not amazing. Like I saw some people being like, this is like a B movie, whatever. I think this is, this is a confusing and frustrating movie. I was very annoyed with it. I was very much of just like, I don't know, just it's so much Ben Affleck simmering and just like staring and just, you know, and I'm just, on into Armist, like all these like awful tropes of like, you know, this like philandering housewife. And I'm just like, I know these two people have been through it. They had like, I, I, I genuinely cannot believe they had a fling during this movie because I would have to imagine like, where was it? You know what? what oh, like, I mean that I, I There's a lot you've said that I got to combat, but that I definitely <laughs> got to disagree with. You think there's a lot of chemistry between these two. In uh, this movie. I think, I think there's a little bit too much, uh, uh, combativeness to really, I think there should be a little bit more simmer, but when they simmer, they simmer, I think. Really? Yeah. I think I'm so. not picking I mean, up on that at all. I think there's a couple of steamy scenes like there's one in particular where it's like them at the car and she like has the cigarette and it's like you can just kind of feel like and there's like a, there's what? a lot of scenes with them in the car where I feel like you can kind of feel like that like that for me it was more tension. of just like I know there's a thin line between love and hate but for me it was just like is he going to uh, like hurt her like do like it, it felt like well that's hatred. part of the tension for sure like, yeah I think that's intentional I don't I don't get any sort of like I, I, don't, I just I don't get it. I don't okay. get it. Maybe I'm just missing something here, but no, go on. What's your, uh, what's your yeah, deep water I mean, take? My deep water take, uh, my deep water take is that I do not know if this is a good film, but I had fun watching it. Uh, that's my big takeaway from this film. I had uh, zero fun. Oh. You had no fun whatsoever. I had a lot no. of fun watching it, but I won't, I don't know if I can go bad and say it's a good film. Like I've heard similar to you i've heard people say that and i don't know if i can quite get there i can't get on their calling this camp yet. i think is nonsense this is not camp people, I don't think it's quite people camp. are abusing the word camp at this point yeah i mean i don't know i wasn't really thinking like this is camp i think it gets a little goofy for sure but I think right i think that's the thing yeah. i think people are using camp as a synonym for goofy and it's like please no <laughs> like right yeah i don't know i mean like that was a conversation that people were having with uh house of gucci and i feel like that i don't know if that was really uh, there's like camp elements to it and i might even use at least the word yeah camp, at least but, house of gucci has campy elements it gets much closer to it than this movie does yeah this isn't quite camp but i get what they're i think they get the sentiment of what people are trying to say here and that like there is like a throwback quality to this film where like like you said it's, it's from a director a journeyman director from you know primarily the 80s and the 90s like he worked obviously in 2000s he worked before that as well but people when they associate with films that he they, they associate that 80s 90s period where they were very you know erotic they were very much based on their stars having like kind of like very steamy passionate relationships with one another and there's something now where it feels like movies i, I think it's basically the marvel thing where like they're just becoming very sterile they're they're coming very chaste as we've kind of just d- discussed in uh previous films that's why it's kind of fascinating to talk about this and x back to back like two movies uh in one week where they're actually characters having sex uh well, openly yeah this yeah. this is disney's first erotic film in 28 years their last yeah. one was color of night and the reason they, they're kind of like you said they they're, they're dumped with this movie they're stuck with this movie because of the fox deal basically yes. so they had to release it and they just dumped it on hulu here in the states and then it's on amazon internationally 
Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot that went, I mean, part of it was the production. They started shooting in 2019. I think they had to do reshoots. Yeah, there were a bunch uh, of delays. Yeah. Cause of yeah. Uh, something, something called coronavirus. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it was partly the Corona. I think they're putting a lot on it as a coronavirus. But I think to your point, like, I think Disney from the get go is just like, I don't know if we really feel this. Like, I think people like they the relationship, the characters aren't like it's kind of hard to understand their dynamic. You really have to kind of spend time with them to really understand what their whole deal is. And I think a lot of people find that unlikable and frustrating as you did. And I get that. But I find that dynamic kind of fascinating. I think it's primarily because I really enjoy Ben Affleck's performance in this film. It's, I think it's very effective use of Ben Affleck, kind of similar to uh, Gone Girl, where it's like it's using his like kind of smarmy charisma, but also like acknowledging that he's like not really over the hill, but like he's kind of he's no longer that like cocksure guy that he was in the 90s or whatever. Like he's a, clearly a dude that. He's a little bit heavier. He, he he has a sadness to him. He has a five o'clock shadow. There's like a bagginess under his eyes. There's clearly like a lot weighing him in his conscience. And like he uses that to really effective effect where it's like, you know, he's like, you know, like there, there's like this disarming quality to him where like he's pretty explicit about his nefarious acts. But there is also like kind of like a sly charm that comes out at times. It's like, OK, are you? joking or not like i can't tell and it's like it seems like you're not joking but you're also kind of playing this kind of light so what's your deal and i think ben affleck plays that to a t and i think that's what i find endearing about the film because it's very much a part of his like whole bizarre career chapter it's it it's a very effective use of ben affleck and i think that's why i'm liking more than the film itself but at the same time i don't think this is like a, a great masterpiece that adrian lynn's return to cinema should be I don't think it's a good combination of director and screenwriters uh, because we have Lynn, who we've mentioned quite a bit. We have Sam Levinson, the you know creator of Euphoria, yeah. you know the Assassination have, uh, Nation, Malcolm and yeah. Marie. Like clearly not a stranger to kind of like simmering movies, sure. But I, you know, also co-writing this with Zach Helm, who's probably best known for Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium. <laughs> yes, it uh, is. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm I'm just I don't know. I just think like this this combination of like these three people, I just I I, I don't know. It just doesn't quite work. I, I don't know. There's there's like a disconnect for me between all these things that you're mentioning, the direction, the way that the film is shot, the inclusion of these snails, the Ben Affleck performance, the Anna de Armas performance, but this little uh, kid is doing like these are all the things snails. that would work independently, yeah. I think. But sure. like put together, I just think it's a whole lot of nothing. Like it's a whole lot of just like starts to ideas, but nothing that comes to fruition. I got, I got to say, I totally disagree about this Ben Affleck performance. I think dude needed a nap and just wanted mm -hmm. so badly not to be here right now during this. Like I just, I don't know. I, I, there's so much effort, but in like the wrong way of just like, it's an effort just to be like uttering these lines that I'm getting from this guy. And like the fact that like you bring up Gone Girl and I'm like that, I think that to me is like, really like a movie that gets how to use Ben Affleck in the way that you're saying. Um, I think that movie and the last duel are two semi, I mean, last duel, more recent example, gone girl, semi recent. Yeah. Also last duel, way different performance than this. I that's like what I'm that saying. It's like there are multiple way ways to use Ben Affleck. I don't, I don't want to make it sound like it's, he has to be done or he has sure. to be acting a certain way for it to work. Yeah. But like this version of him, I guess like this is like a little bit of an echo of him in like the way back. Um, where he's, you know, he, he, there's a way to have him as like the bit of a sad sack, you know, like you sure. got to feel pity for him, I guess. And well, that's and, why I find, yeah, that, that actually, that gets to something I find very fascinating about this film, but sorry, go ahead. Well, that's the thing. It's like the movie could have done that, I think in a compelling way, but then where it goes, it's like, I'm saying, it's like, it just does not have anything smart to say at all and it's like there are so many things about modern romance that are fascinating that have really evolved since the 50s and so like if you're going to adapt the book i think that you have to do way more to bring that about and this movie just doesn't it just sort of i don't know limps to the finish line a bit and I, the idea of like a guy like this like this like inner rage, you know, just like my wife is doing this and like, he doesn't know how to deal with it. And, but does he, but is he dealing with it? And it's like, even like the mystery thriller elements behind like, Oh, is he, is he murdering these guys and all that stuff? Like it's just handled. So like 
haphazardly without it be i don't know there's such a better way to do this movie like i don't want to make it sound like the concept is what doesn't work it's just like the execution is just so bad like i just i just think it's a total whiff um so yeah i didn't have any fun with it and i think this is i i think anna de Armas is a great actress but this performance is terrible like i i just genuinely was well, like i thought she was pretty good this is the same actress from like even she was better at knock knock compared to this like that's how well, that bad this gets no, oh I, I disagree with you i think that is a movie that is not a good film but i could right. see people having fun watching that this movie no the only performance here that i thought was kind of fun that i was kind of like you know, having a little bit of a John Gurney smile was Tracy sure, Letts. Tracy, I was going to say, I, thought, I figured you, you, would, you would get kicked out of Tracy Letts. Yeah, he's he's he actually gets some moments here. Uh, there's one involving like a phone and a car that I, yes, I genuinely so was funny. like laughing. Yeah, so it's, that's <laughs> peak goofiness for the film. And I, I like right, that right. up to that. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah, I mean, look, I haven't read the book, but I imagine there's probably more in Patricia Highsmith's novel about like keeping up with appearances. Like if it is from the mm-hmm. late 50s, I imagine there's more. About, the social like, circle, the busybody right. neighbors. Yeah. And I feel like that's the thing about the movie that I think is probably the most confusing is that like I didn't quite understand. Like I like the movie is set in New Orleans where it's like, you know, things are a little bit looser here. People don't really judge. We're just kind of here to have fun. And like, we find it's a little weird, but you know, they invite us to these cool parties and stuff. But I did kind of feel like I never quite got exactly what the vibe of the neighbors were, except for like Tracy Letts and like to a milder extent, like Lil Ray Howery, who's just kind of just like, look, like, I don't know, like you're a cool drinking buddy, but you're also weird as you're freaking me heck. out. Yeah. <laughs> um, which I found kind of amusing too, but yeah, I mean, I think the New Orleans setting actually kind of adds like something kind of interesting to that dynamic that I wish they explored a little bit more. But I don't know. I, I really just enjoy that. Like the movie is just about like this weird power dynamic where these two people are constantly thinking that they have the power in the relationship and they constantly like one up each other in these very elaborate and extreme ways. And I think the performances here do a really fun job of effectively communicating that. I think Ben Affleck is doing a better job than on the Armist, but that's I think it's more because Ben Affleck has a little bit more to chew on with the material. And I think, like you said, that uh, one of the f- film's faults is that. Uh, on the Armas, his character kind of gets uh, pigeonholed into kind of uh, tired tropes. Uh, and I do wish that there was a little bit more, you know, a, a little bit more eroticism with their relationship. I feel like, especially coming from Adrian Lynn, I feel like the, the even though he is like probably like 70 something when he made this movie, it feels like I was expecting a little bit more, you know, actual like sex in the movie i feel like they there's only really like a handful of scenes with the, with any sort of sexual dynamic between them but um yeah i don't know i feel like the the whole thing is just a good bit of goofy fun and i can see why people don't really like it because i it can get a little sluggish and it can be a little bizarre and what it's trying to do and I, I feel like the reshoots are probably working against the film because there's like a sort of sterile quality to a lot of scenes i have to imagine were because of you know movies being shot again in covid and people weren't really sure how to pull this off and like even like ben looks different like you know like they're you can kind of like see between scenes that he gets like heavier and thinner in a really weird way and that kind of adds a a weird sort of disarming quality to the film but i don't know i i had fun watching it's definitely a fun streaming watch for me at least i i get the sense you know the people just they want movies like this you know, maybe this movie isn't as good, but like, you know, they want they want their trashy movies that are just for adults. You know, they want their adult swim content. Right. They don't. The, I think people are getting people are really sick of like, oh, like you've said, it, just all of these big franchise tent pulls, all these superhero, you know, all these big, you know, you know Batman and these, these serious things that. Yeah, the. The Disney-fying of films, like making them very, like making everything for younger audiences or a younger mentality, at least. Well, four quadrant, you know, because that's what makes money. And I think people are just sort of like, oh, this is a boring time for movies um, in some people's opinions, because they're like, well, you, we used to have a time where you just got so many kinds of different films, you know, even even in um, you know, there were there were low periods. There were like, the, I think the 80s that got a little bit harder to, to find good. Um, but the 70s and the 90s were good times for this. And, you know, I, I think that people just genuinely want more of this and they're, they're kind of going to bad for this movie. They're being like, well, you know what? Yeah, this, this, this movie's kind of fun. Like you're saying, it's, it's, it's got something and it, it's at least doing something a little different. And for me, I, I can't say that I, I, it worked for me, but I can, I can sympathize with that 
desire for variety, you know, for this kind of movie to be a little bit more commonplace. And we get we get lots of stuff like this in TV, like we should say, right? Like it's not it's not like we don't get that kind of content anywhere. It's just sort of like it doesn't happen with film as often because in film it's just it's a little bit more of a time commitment in terms of like a sit down commitment. And I think that it it's just harder to make money, even though it's weird because these are pretty low budget things. And I think we are hitting the age of like the, the streaming release movie where they can do more of that sort of thing. It's just that I think they usually go for the TV show because the TV series tends to have more lasting power. It's longer. People watch more of it, talk about it longer. And so it's, it's more effective for the business model. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes and no, I guess. I mean, like certainly something like Euphoria seems to be a little bit more risk taking and absurd. And, you know, it's certainly a lot. Of stuff I wasn't thinking of Euphoria for that. I was thinking of stuff like uh, Behind Her Eyes, you know. OK, I haven't seen that, but I mean, I'll take your word for it. There are a whole bunch of like Netflix shows like that, you know, that because I think Euphoria is a little bit more of like it's trying to be like it's not being as silly and fun uh, from my I haven't seen the show, I should mention. But, you know, my understanding. Uh, Yeah. I don't but know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't watched Euphoria either, but I've seen all the tweets and stuff about it. It just seems like a bizarre show that has like very, you know, high strung personalities kind of yelling at each other. And I bring up Euphoria because, you know, the Sam Levingson connection. Also, the one actor from Euphoria is in this movie, too. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, yeah, we're in a really undeniably bizarre time for films. And I don't think this is like the return to sex that people wanted it to be. Like, it doesn't feel like. You know, it doesn't feel like it's like a return to form for Adrian Lynn. It doesn't really feel like it's like the comeback that I think people wanted for Ben Affleck. But it, it is, you know, it, it does feel like something to me. It feels like a film that's rooted in, you know, character dynamics that's meant to be for adults at a time when such things are becoming more and more rarity in mainstream cinema. And uh, I can certainly applaud that for sure. All right. Well, yeah, I guess we'll just we'll just sort of agree and disagree and all kinds of things in between i don't know but yeah, I, don't uh, know. I mean look i don't know I, I i can't see how you find this movie boring it's so bizarre <laughs> I, 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 I just think it's it's paced horribly and it's extremely just i think the pacing vapid. is weird uh, very vapid i wouldn't call it vapid but i would i agree i'll agree with you with the pacing it is bizarrely paced film all right. Well, I guess we can just play the Rotten Tomatoes game then. Let's see. Sure. Let's see what Rotten Tomatoes collectively, the critics, have to say about this one. Now, we have 167 reviews counted, so more than X. Hmm. And what do you think, Will Ashton? Out of, out of the 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, where do you think this one falls? Uh, 46%. 36%. Uh, well, I was 10 off again. 10 off again. And this time it was lower. Yeah. Um, but audience well, yeah, score. Yeah, yeah. Audience score. We have two hundred and fifty plus ratings. Not verified though. Fifty two percent. Twenty three percent. Ooh. You thought you were like, you know what? I have a feeling maybe maybe people like this one more. I don't know. Uh, there, I, there's I a, see. I see mm-hmm. people going to bat for this movie, and I don't blame them. I'm hey, some friends of the show have uh, Kaylee Donaldson. He's been on. She she gave it the rolled fresh tomato. Over on Pajiba.com. So, you know, it's there. There are dozens of you, right? Um, uh, I mean, I guess I'm more favorable than on. I, I just enjoyed watching it more than anything. I'm not going to say it's a good or effective film, but it's just so undeniably goofy and erotic in a way that I feel like most movies don't even try to be. And they got to give that credit in my own little way. Let's turn it to Rotten to- or not Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, Letterboxd. Uh, Letterboxd. Next. Yeah. We have there's going to be no uh, cinema score for this one, right? No, yeah, it's on Hulu. So, um, so we have fewer watches on Letterbox. Interestingly, so more critic reviews, fewer Letterboxed logs, uh, twenty six thousand, and yeah, we out of five. What do you think the Letterbox average is? What is your uh, guess? Uh, two point four. Spot on again. Art right. Will, are you cheating? <laughs> I'm no. a little I'm a little suspicious. You got the you got the letterbox score correct twice in a row. Spot on. The season old knocking. Ah <laughs> uh, man. Yeah. I, I don't know what yours looks like, but I mean I see plenty of positives here. I see some three stars. I see some like friend of the show, Isaac Feldberg. He's he gave it four stars. He's like, you know what? Deal with it. I don't care. Yeah. Right. He 
he is a man of his own heart. He follows his uh, his he own rating his system, and I gotta apply it. Yeah, because because we have much lower scores like uh, Aaron Dicer, also friend of the show, gave it one and a half. Anna Sasek, friend of the show, gave it two stars. You know, so clearly there's a range here. There's some people who are like, "This is it. This is the this is some the tweet." People, uh, just can't have enjoy a nice pool party, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what Chris Evangelista. He logged it, but he didn't. Uh, he didn't start, so I think he's still chewing on it. So maybe, maybe we'll have to follow up with him later. Um, I, I know that he, I think he probably saw it early and then just didn't fall back when he was on embargo to maybe I haven't been on Twitter it. much. So yeah, I haven't seen if he uh, had any sort of take online, but yeah, that is deep water. It is now available to watch on Hulu. If you're watching internationally, it's on Amazon Prime Video. All right. So we wanted to finish the show out a little bit, just like a quick uh, run through of South by Southwest. Now, I, I didn't see a lot this year. I, I had way too much to do. I, I saw um, uh, a film, right? Well, I saw X, you know. Yeah, sure. So two films. <laughs> two films. Uh, yeah, I saw the uh, Chumba Wumba documentary. I get knocked down. Did not like it. Yeah, that was one of the weaker ones I saw, unfortunately. And I was looking forward to it. Like, I remember yeah. when I heard about I didn't even know this was a thing. And then I someone mentioned a Chumba Wumba documentary play at South by Southwest. And I was like, John, why didn't you tell me there was a Chumba Wumba documentary? And he was like, because it, it ain't no good. And I'm like, you think <laughs> I ain't care no good, about Bill. <laughs> Yeah. You think and I care? <laughs> I will watch it even if it sucks. Um, I, yeah, I immediately put it on, and uh, I think I was maybe slightly more in the movies camp than you were, but I found it to be unfortunately uh, uh, an, an ineffective, I guess, film. It, it didn't. It had some interesting things to say about you know the legacy of bands and artistic intent and the role that musicians can play in you know uh, in their art versus like what how people process their art, but I, I just think it's, uh, it's kind of marred by, uh, so, so filmmaking and, uh, some just kind of, uh, you know, kind of self-indulgent moments, unfortunately. Well, I should say, you know, there, there are a couple of other South by films that, you know, re were recycled through the festival, um, from Sundance. And then also, there are a couple of releases that, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be, I'm going to be watching this week and be seeing the lost city, which played, um yeah i today, see that actually. uh i was gonna say i see that tonight yeah me too so uh, I'll, I'll wave at you from Hot california dang. um yeah. and then also everything everywhere all at once which i was supposed to watch last week um but there was like a bit of a mix-up so hoping to see that though later this week on oh man day. i keep trying to see if that's playing near me i really 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 want to see that movie so bad and I, i'm really worried it's not gonna be playing in pittsburgh but hopefully I hope it, it is. will hopefully it will um I know, uh, you know I there's a lot of TV stuff that Daniels. premiered, yeah. you know, like the new yeah. season of Upload, We Crashed, the the WeWork narrative on Apple, um, the Halo series that's going to be on Paramount Plus, I think. It, it got a little bit of, yeah. Um, uh, not a lot Swimming of stuff with that, Sharks. Say again? Swimming with Sharks, I think, premiered. The the old Quibi show that became a Roku show. Yeah, yeah. The Boys, um, I think, played uh, some of its new season. Atlanta right. played some of its new season. Mm -hmm. There was like a lot yeah, of stuff. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I will. I, I know you saw a lot of films. What was there anything like, what's your overall impression of what you saw? Like kind of connecting everything together. Cause I know you weren't able to see a lot of things because mm -hmm. the online portion was like separate, right. From what people were yeah. able to see in person. So of the online offerings, like what, what's your impression? Do you think it was a, a good fest? Yeah. I mean, I feel like a lot of the buzzier films, as you were mentioning, were, uh, only available to people in person. Like, for instance, like you, like you said, uh, Everything Everywhere at Once, which seemed to be far and away the best film of the festival by critics' estimation, was not made available to uh, online-only people. Likewise, uh, you know, like you said, The Lost City X, both which got very strong reviews, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Uh, all these movies that got really high notices were only made available to people who were in person in Austin, Texas to see those at the premieres. Um and also, I think Descent, which was a Sundance film that I really wanted to see and catch up on, was only made available to uh, people in person, even though that's a Netflix film. For some reason, that was only available uh, in person, and I was bummed I couldn't catch up on that one. But uh, to answer your question, um, I feel like overall, like I think like my favorite film of the festival, I think, outshines not only what I saw last year at South by Southwest, but what I also saw this year is Sundance. Like, I think it's a really tremendous film, and I'll be talking about that in a bit. But I feel Dead like... Stream? Uh, no, <laughs> I did see Deadstream. Do you want me to talk about that? <laughs> no, I, just, I was just goofing. Okay, Deadstream was all right. 
it was kind of fun. It's like uh, it's like a streamer version of Blair Witch Project, but more in the spirit of the Evil Dead, where it's like a, a canceled streamer who goes into a haunted house to, uh, you know, kind of videotape his paranormal activity and things don't exactly go uh, according to plan or do they? You want to see the movie to find out. Um, but yeah, that, that was an all right film. That's it's, it's very goofy, but very fun uh, at the same time. Um, yeah, I, I think the highlight for me of the festival was the Nick Cave documentary from Andrew Dominique, which is this much I know to be true, uh, which, you know, I mean, go figure. I'm going to go bat for the Nick Cave movie. But uh, it was just it was the first movie I saw at the festival. It was the one I was most looking forward to. And it was just uh, honestly a pretty transcendent experience. I just had a, a great experience watching that film and it was just uh yeah great uh great music great uh photography uh you know i i really enjoyed everything about that film a lot and i think that was a highlight for sure and that was the one i started with and so i feel like i don't know i feel like quality wise this year i saw more good than bad films but i feel like there are more highs at last year's festival than like i feel like the movies i really enjoyed last year were more consistent than this year where it's like it was a lot of like yeah it was pretty good or like i enjoyed that but i didn't i didn't walk away like loving too many films in a way that i feel like like last year there was like the fallout there was the uh woodlands dark and true documentary there was here today um there was a few other movies oh best summer ever of course which you know took my heart and ran away with it um <laughs> and then john stepped ninja, all over it and then <laughs> yeah ninja baby was also really solid yeah. i feel like there were less movies like that this year that were like fun and goofy and really disarmingly sweet Mm -hmm. uh it was just a lot it was like some solid music documentaries some pretty good horror movies and a few solid dramas but unless i was like walking away being like yes that was like why i love to go to south by southwest yeah and i wondered too you know like yeah because that's the online portion part part of the reason that i didn't I, i didn't have a lot of time but i also was like you know what i just feel like i want to devote my full attention to these movies when i see them And, uh, you know, I have a feeling like last year's South by I'll have a chance, you know, to catch up later for sure. Um, yeah, a little unfortunate. I think that the offerings this year were a little bit all over the place. It seems like, and it seemed, it's, I don't know, like it just seemed like all of the big buzzy things too. Usually South by like gives you a nice preview of things that are going to come out in the summer too. like smaller movies that are to come out maybe in like July and August as like counter programming. Um, but I didn't catch a lot of that sort of thing. I think like a lot of the buzzier things are going to be coming out pretty soon. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what the deals with that, but yeah, a little sad. Maybe next year, maybe next year we'll be there. I mean, um, so you said this much I know is true is your favorite. Yeah, that was my favorite. I mean, I think one of the buzzier films was the Pat Oswald one. I love my dad. I think oh that yeah. Like, I heard I think that stuff. won the narrative prize or one of the narrative prizes. Oh, maybe uh, it did. I, I like that one a good bit. Um, yeah, it was, you know, it, it, it I thought it was going to be more like world's greatest dad. And it's not quite that, but it, it's definitely it's good, squirmy, awkward sort of uh, father son dramedy stuff. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Plays, if it, if you're going to watch world's greatest dad, then the screen would just show your reflection. Mm, mm-hmm. OK, that doesn't really work if I don't have kids, but um, uh, I maybe, maybe not biologically, sense. but sure. Anyway, Uh <laughs> Um, are the but, listeners yeah. of Cinemaholics your children, Malashin? Uh, it, were there any were there any films that you wanted to see that Me? you didn't get a chance to? Plenty, plenty. Um, like what? Uh, you've already kind of named a bunch of them. I mean, this much I know is true was one that I mm-hmm. planned to see. I had it like queued up and everything. Um, just didn't get my chance, unfortunately. Everything, everywhere, all at once. I feel like we just we, we mentioned these already. Um, okay. I was also kind of curious about the unbearable weight of massive talent. Yes, of um, course. Yeah, that's the other one that I mean, only online, but yeah. that's coming out April 22nd, uh, same weekend as a Northman. That's going to be an amazing, hopefully amazing weekend at the movies for your it's old one of the few, Will Ashton. Yeah, it's one of the few trailers I've seen lately because um, it played before X. And so I was like, whoa, this is a Will Ashton movie if I ever saw it. <laughs> I'm really um, excited and nervous about that one. I, it's yeah. either going to be very much my thing or it's going to be a huge disappointment. So we'll see. I did really want to see Linoleum um the call oh, yeah, that West was pretty movie. good yeah I, I yeah. saw that one that was with jim gaffigan and Rhea seahorn i i really like jim gaffigan when he's in that mode you know and so mm-hmm. i i'm looking forward to it uh, i heard seriously uh, red is kind of cool uh i was disappointed by seriously red really i like rose burn crazy, but... and bobby yeah. cannavale so i was like oh you i mean uh you, you get to see uh rose burn as an elvis presley impersonator which is pretty cool but she's really not in the movie that much okay She's like um, a supporting character. 
All right, all right. Uh, I do want to see Bad Axe. Uh, that Bad Axe is good. That's a good documentary. I want to see that. That's you'll definitely like that on my one. list. I was going to recommend that one to you. I think you'll like that one a lot. Yeah, because in terms of documentaries, it was like that one I was curious about. I'm kind of curious about Spaz because um, you know how much I love computer uh, animation. Yeah, um, Spaz was all right. A little weird. Um, I feel like, the execution of that one kind of failed it a bit, but I, I really, I think that's a compelling subject that I think it almost makes up for it. There are a few of these that like, I wouldn't see them in theaters documentary wise. Like I would say like the Pez outlaw, you know, just oh, like, as, like a casual good. watch. Yeah. Cause I it's like just like, one. I like stuff like that. I like, I like documentaries that are about very niche things like toys and, and yeah. these, these weird events that have happened yeah. that it's just like, like yeah. McMillions, you know, just like this weird, conspiracy controversy kind of thing right um, yeah this one a little bit better than mcmillions but yeah very playful very winsome also pretty kind of sad by the end but in a way that i think it's it's stylish but not like overly so uh like it's not like not not like style over substance or anything like that it it, it has a compelling story that really leans into in a fun way and also a fun subject um also there's a finished film that i really enjoyed that i haven't seen a lot of people talk about but i, I felt pretty taken by it was called um the blind man who did not want to see titanic Oh, uh, yeah. I saw a little bit of action about that movie, actually. I, I found that really, really compelling uh, movie. Like, it, it's pretty short, too. A lot of movies I saw this year were short. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's it's like a, a, a blind film fan. Like he was not blind at birth, but became blind due to um, a multiple uh, sclerosis diagnosis. And he connects with this woman over the phone through like their shared love of film. And he tries to go out to see her and shot in a way that like it's not like you it's not POV, but like it has like a visually kind of distorted look to it where you can you get into his like perspective where you have trouble really seeing what's going on around him and only really can see like his facial expressions for most of the film and it's kind of bizarre but also kind of gorgeous at the same time it's really i I thought that was one of the standout films of the festival cool cool yeah i mean it seems interesting um i I, you know i'm going to be watching mickey the story of a mouse i know you saw that um yeah produced by morgan uh, neville it was bad uh, n- meh. it was a lot of pandering to the corporate ah, people, and, and then like some like it's like seventy five percent pandering and twenty five percent like yeah we gotta acknowledge that Mickey Mouse did blackface. Uh, that was a bummer. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm still gonna watch it. Uh, yeah, um, but that's the weird thing about that is that the, that's the director of Marwin Call, the director of who? The movie Marwin Call, the s- inspiration for Welcome to Marwin. Oh, I did not know that. Um, you see the documentary Marwin Call? It's a really good documentary. You've talked about it. Yeah. Um, the, the other two docs that I was curious about, uh, which you already kind of gave me a heads up that they weren't, that this one wasn't as uh, good as it should have been. It wasn't as radical as Tony Hawk until the wheels fall off. I want to watch a Tony it's Hawk right. documentary. That's yeah, good. I mean, I went into it like, yeah. Tony. And I left it like, yeah. But apparently it's not that great. It's only okay. It's I just guess. very straightforward. Yeah. It, I, I was hoping it'd be more about like, Tony of today, where he's like, I used to be this hot shot skateboarder. Now people don't even recognize me on the street. And yeah. it was more just like, here's the Tony Hawk story, which is fine. It's enjoyable. But it's a fun story. Um, yeah, I was going to. Did you hear about? Um, oh, what was it called? Uh, um, oh, uh, the Rhea Morano movie. I was going to ask you about that one. I felt like you would have really gotten a kick out the of what that movie? One. The one with Rhea Morano. Which one was that? Uh, I got to I'm blanking on the name of it. I have to look it up. But um. She plays like a, a vindictive teacher and the students try to like. Uh, oh, the get, prank. The prank. That's it. Yeah. I knew it had kind of a generic title, but that was a kind of fun movie. I forgot a, a really about great, that one. A really great Rita Moreno performance. She really has a lot of fun with it. Also, a Keith David has a really fun supporting performance in that, too. Love Keith that David. Was enjoyable. Yeah. Um, oh, another one I was going to mention documentary wise is Under the Influence, which we chatted a little bit about some of the surrounding oh, yeah. stuff because you saw it you about were, the YouTuber uh, David Dobrik. Yeah, you. Yeah, you had to kind of fill me in because I didn't know that guy that well. I'm not. I'm it's not interesting. In the yeah. Scene. Well, you mentioned that there's like a, a morsel of Josh Peck content in there, which is interesting. He has like a new book coming out, so Josh Peck is kind of oh, you know. Does he? Yeah, oh. yeah. I think it might already be out, but he's kind of trying. He's in full marketing mode right now. Mm. But I uh, mean, I told you this. I uh, it there's not anything super damning about him in the movie, but I, I found the movie. I I thought less of Josh Peck due to association with those people. Um, Right. That's why I'm interested yeah. to see it, you know, because like, there's a lot of stuff about that that I, I have. I have like a surface level understanding of some of the stuff that went down. Um, and, and I think I'm interested in a documentary that maybe is a little bit more detailed on. Uh, like, that's the cool thing about docs. It's like it's a lot of it can be information you're aware of, but just the way 
it pieces it together and it presents the narrative of it in a, in a way that like recontextualizes, you know, like the, the Britney Spears, you know, conservatory doc, you know, kind of does that. Um, it's interesting stuff. Um, in terms of narrative films, I heard pirates wasn't that great. Um, I heard I conflicting things. I didn't see it. So I can't talk about it. Yeah. Spin me round. I heard was okay. You saw that, right? Yeah, that was all right. I feel like, I think you're a little bit more favorable on that director than I am. Um, what's his name? Jeff Bana. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I feel like he he bounces between a bunch of different genres, but he only really makes like three out of five films for me. Where I'm <laughs> just like, that was pretty good. Like, well, I enjoyed it's it because he co-writes it with uh, Alison Brie. Yeah, and they uh, and she's they wrote in Horse Girl with together. them, or they're both in it, right? Yeah, but they also wrote Ho- Horse Girl from two years yeah. ago. Yeah, so it's kind of yeah. like ooh, you know, because I liked Horse Girl, right? So that yeah, was pretty good. Again, like I feel like every one of their movies I've seen, I'm like, yeah, pretty all right, like decent. Decent There's, movie, and I, yeah, I know Aubrey Plaza is in it, and Zach Woods. Is Zach Woods is he good in it? Like, and Tim Heidecker, I heard is in it too. Right, but are uh, they really like in it, or is it like, you know, oh, whatever? Yeah. Uh, well, Tim Heidecker is like more of a glorified okay. supporting role, but Zach Woods guess. is like probably Zach Woods is probably like the fourth or fifth lead of it. Oh, cool! I I want a Zach Woods Renaissance. Yeah, did you he, see the short film that he made with Will Ferrell? No, I don't think so. You got to see that. That's actually a really good short film. Oh, send he me the link. I'll that. be right on that. <laughs> I'll have to find it. I, I don't know if it's still on. It, it, they took it off YouTube. But I'm sure I can find it elsewhere. You'll you'll get you'll get a big kick out of it. it there, makes me want to see what Zach Woods does as director next. There there aren't really a lot of other things, honestly, that I was that into or that curious about. You know, another few cow movies, I guess. Um, I don't know. Oh, the cow. Could they? There was the cow. There was there was something else with cow in the title. I don't know. Cows are white. Was it? Um, I think. Oh, okay. Could they, we already got first cow. I don't need a second cow. I don't need the um, cow, you know? Uh, there was um, two Leslie that was pretty good. That was with uh, Andrea Risenborough and Mark Marin. A really solid uh, uh, drama, character drama. They shot on like 35 millimeter. Just a really like solid little movie. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I like, yeah. I like Alice and Janney and, you know, sure. Yeah. I don't know anything about it besides um oh there's a russian movie i liked a good bit called nika that was also shot i think on like 35 millimeter well how was uh, how was yeah. a movie like that kind of in context right of like all the russia ukraine stuff uh awkward uh yeah. it, it's uh, there's nothing really in the movie that's like pro state anything like you know it's like just that. like kind of like yeah it's, this is just you know it's just a about, russian movie it, it's a it's a russian produced movie about a, a tragic russian figure yeah uh but yeah i mean it's a good movie I like that one, but it's okay. an awkward one. To, it's an awkward one to recommend now for sure. Um, I guess I'll, I, I guess I have to watch the Gabriel, the Gabby Giffords documentary out of obligation. Which one um, is that one? Huh? Gabby Which Giffords one? won't back down. Okay. I missed that one. I didn't see it. You know, it's, it's kind of this year's like knock down the house, I guess. It's just one of those like very sort of like a mainstream Democrat kind of puff documentaries. And in this case, I think Gabby Giffords, it's a, it's an incredible story. Like, you know, how she survived, um, you know, a gunman nearly killing her and, you know, yeah, obviously went through some really horrible stuff. Um, um but, uh, yeah, I, I, I say out of obligation because I, I tend to watch those kind of political docs just mm-hmm. out of like curiosity of like, you know, what's the yeah. deal here? Um, there was one I was curious to hear your perspective on. I was sorry I didn't get to hear it, which is without prescription, which is about uh, a woman in Puerto Rico who yeah. uh, sort of uh, gets uh, um, reacquainted with her OCD. And it really it, it says a lot about like the Puerto Rican culture that I found really compelling. And I wanted to hear your perspective on it. And unfortunately, that's not an option I can have right now, but maybe later on. Yeah, I, I am absolutely going to be watching that movie because I'm literally working on a, a book that's set in Puerto Rico. Um, and I'm kind of, you know, I've been consuming a lot of like modern Puerto Rican, uh, you know, art lately and sort of, you know, it's been a long time since I was on the island. And so I, I certainly, uh, you know, want to catch up a bit on some of like what's been going on. And it, it's interesting yeah. that like a movie kind of this subject matter is coming out, you know, well, usually when you yeah. think of Puerto Rico, it's all about the hurricane. It's all about all that right. stuff. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just more about like, like there's, I guess there's like a lot of like a stigma around mental illness in Puerto Rico, at least the way the film portrays it that like, they don't really dwell on a lot, but I was curious to hear your perspective on that. Like how the family really like kind of tries to dismiss like her mental illness in a way that's like not direct, but also like that, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's one I, I want to hear your thoughts on a little bit more in depth. Cause I, I was curious. That one's a, a pretty compelling little movie. 
I don't I don't know when it's coming out. I, like in a in a release sort of form, but I, I certainly want to mm. see it. But yeah. Uh, yeah, looking forward to it when I do. All right, well. Is there any last thoughts on South by before we close it and you head out of here? Uh, solid fest. I mean, you know, more decent than not. Um, few films I walk away being like, yes, like absolutely. You got to see that. But, uh, at least a few that I was like, yeah, that was good. Or at least something I like worth yeah. diving into Sounds and, solid. and discussing. Yeah. I mean, there were other movies I, like I enjoyed or at least were compelled by one was called is in us all. And another one, um, called shadow that i found pretty interesting uh, i don't think either of them are like flawless but they have really interesting and compelling nuanced things to say and yeah i found like those like i said more uh good than bad also uh um courtney barnett documentary called anonymous club was one i enjoyed so yeah good stuff all right well that is south by now in terms of next week's releases and I'll, oh sorry i forgot to mention there was another movie called Cheaper by the dozen, which hit Disney Plus. We did not talk about this week, but you can't if okay. you want to. If you want to see what Zach Braff, we, uh, Gabrielle yeah. Union are up to, um, we're not talking about Alice or uh, Master. No, we got. I guess we got to call it here. But uh, okay. yeah, we can say you know which which movie do you recommend? I think for me, it's uh, probably Master, but yeah, kind of reluctantly. It's on Amazon. Um, yeah, it's on Prime Video. I should say. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we really have time for an in-depth conversation. I don't know if you really care to. I, I think it's a kind of messy but intriguing film. Like, I don't think it quite captures everything that it wants to do too successfully. And I think the end falters in a way that really... If it had nailed the ending, I think I would have been more receptive and more willing to give it a higher grade. But I think there's enough there that I find really compelling that I, I think it's worth seeing for sure. I think it's it's a movie that I'd rather talk about than Alice. Right. Alice it's a very is academic just, film. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, Master, I think, makes a lot of mistakes. A lot of missteps. And I'm really annoyed that people are trying to compare it to, like, Get Out. It's not Get Out. It, it, it reminds it, me more of Dear White People. A little bit, yeah. It's like Dear yeah. White People with a bit of a uh, supernatural edge to it, you know? Uh, whereas yeah. Alice, I just think, is, like, another... It's a better version of Antebellum, from what I can tell. I didn't see Antebellum, but, but a worse I, I read version the takes. of it's it's a better version of Antebellum, but a worse version of Django Unchained. There you go. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, there are certainly better movies in general that people can watch over those two ones. Um, not to say anything about the the talent of the people involved. I think like Kiki Palmer and Alice is quite great. Common. Oh yeah, I think Kiki Palmer is really and, good in um, uh, Alice, and she looks like she's going to be great yeah. in uh, Nope. I agree. I agree. I'm excited about that one. And then Regina Hall, I think, is, is good in Master. I, I, I don't think it has anything to do with her performance. So um, and she, and she co-stars with Zoe Renee, who I thought is an interesting lead performance. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, certainly I, I think the script lets her down um, against her, her control there. Well, do you think that was more the filmmaker? This is the last thing I'll say about Master, because this is okay. just a question. I went to, um, is that you think a failure of the filmmaker or a failure of the producers where the producers are trying to be more like make this more like get out so we can kind of market this better? Or do you think that was a filmmaker having too many ideas to really explore in one film effectively? The former is my lead guest. The director is Mariana Diallo. This is her first film. And I do think there were some of those pressures because I I have to imagine that that's the case. Now, there are some things that I think that you could like throw to her feet involving some things that happen toward the end and how things are shot. But yeah, the, I, I would recommend people who are curious. Like, and if you do see the movie, uh, you know, read some reviews uh, from you know, black critics who have something to say about how the movies like a uh, depiction of like the black experience uh, seem to rub them the wrong way or seem to come off as inauthentic. Um, obviously yeah. I can't speak to that directly, but right. I certainly I got that to, sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have a few reviews I have on my phone right now. I wanted to read, I wish I did more before we talked about it, but yeah, it's, it's one I, uh, I, it's one like, I kind of like want to lean back and hear people talk about more than I really want to say anything. Sure. I'm like, I, I think I liked it overall, but I'm not 100% sure where I land on it ultimately. Now, next week, uh, I think the big movie is going to be Everything Everywhere All at Once. Uh, looking for another A24 movie. Yeah, if you're able to see it, hopefully you can yeah. from the Daniels, Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinart. Uh, uh, their yeah. follow up from, uh, or I guess it's Daniel Scheinart's follow up from uh, The Death of Dick Long, but they're together follow up from Swiss Army Man. Yeah. Very, looking much, very much looking forward to that one. Um, Me too. Uh, that one stars Michelle Yeoh and mm-hmm. Jenny Slade, Harry Shum Jr., Jamie Lee Curtis. I'm, I'm excited. I, I, I certainly am looking forward to seeing that. And then also we, we might be able to talk about The Lost City because uh, we're seeing that yeah. tonight, right? So that's Paramount. And certainly. I don't know anything about it, except I know Sandra Bullock and Channing Tatum in it. And I think Daniel Radcliffe, but 
Mm-hmm. I, I could, I'm not 100% sure. I haven't seen the trailer. I don't know anything about it. Oh, really? I've seen the trailer a bunch of times. There's all, Oh, you, do you not know the cameo? I do not know. Uh, oh, I won't spoil it. There's a big don't tell cameo me that they reveal in the trailer, and it's probably going to be way more fun if you don't know going into it. I okay. hope it's unspoiled. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. I don't want to know. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know if there's anything. There might be other things coming out that I'm just not, not aware of, like streaming releases, but uh, I guess we can look forward to those two movies or talk about those two movies soon uh, if mm-hmm. things work out. But until then, hey, look, if you like the show and you're like, I got to support you, I want to give you guys money. Go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash cinemaholics in the show notes, or buy some of our merch on cinemaholics.com. We got t-shirts, hoodies, mug shots, mug shots, shot glasses, and coffee mugs. We should call them mug shots. Um, whatever you like. It's all on the, the Cinemaholics website. And connect with, us, connect with us on social media. Say hi or email us, cinemaholicspodcast at gmail.com. If you want to say something and you don't care what we're going to say in response, um, we'll be honest. So, all right, that's it for us this week. From the Internet California, I'm John Negroni. And for Internet Pennsylvania, I'm watching. See you next time. <laughs>